Deep within the jungle. We're talking about a civilization discovered in the middle of a rainforest. Cryptic remains of a lost civilization, one that spanned a continent for more than a thousand years. They definitely had attributes of the supernatural. They were the ancient Maya. Their rulers filled vast cities with sky-high pyramids, ornate palaces, and lavish plazas. They were masters of their environment. They were very resourceful in figuring out how to harness the energy, creating amazingly sophisticated works of art and engineering, and sustaining a civilization for 1,500 years. Then, after generations of prosperity and innovation, the ancient civilization collapsed, turning bustling cities into ghost towns to be reclaimed by Mother Nature. Centuries later, answers to the mystery surrounding these majestic people and the godlike kings who ruled them tell a story of conquest, ingenuity, and disaster. In 1969 AD, in the lowlands of the Guatemalan jungle, the Maya are becoming desperate. Food and clean water are dwindling. Thousands of people are starving. And malnutrition and disease are ravaging the population. The Maya no longer trust their divine rulers to appease their gods. Political turmoil plagues the kingdoms, and one by one, the great city-states are being abandoned the ancient Maya civilization is crumbling. City after city, area after area begins to fail. Cities are abandoned, kings disappear, um, and what had been classic Maya culture really comes to an end. What happened to this great people? Even today, scholars are still mystified. We know that people began to disappear. The question is, how did that happen? The answer may lie in complex hieroglyphics known as the Maya Code. A hieroglyph is a complex way of uh, conveying all the information that Maya people could think or express. And is the only example in the Americas of a complete, complex system of writing. Today, these cryptic symbols reveal a history of brutal warfare, larger-than-life rulers, and the rise and fall of an enigmatic people. Hi, I'm Peter Weller, and I'm standing on top of this beautiful temple deep in the rainforest of southern Mexico near the border of Guatemala, and this is the heart of the civilization of the ancient Maya. For years, archaeologists believed that the ancient Maya were peacefully separated into 40 or so independent city-states, each with their own dynasty of kings. For what we could tell, there seemed to be trade, communication, but there didn't seem to be any particular imperial aggression motivated by a thirst for land or power outside of a king's own territory. But in the last half century, these theories are starting to fly in the face of a different story because hieroglyphs like this one, the remnants of the ancient Maya's advanced writing system, are painting a whole new picture. The touchy-feely 1960s and New Age ideas of a gentle and loving people are being fast replaced by a much more complex reality of city-states butting heads in bloody clashes. And now we have evidence that brutal battles and human sacrifice were fundamental components of life among the ancient Maya. But the evolution of the Maya civilization into this complex network of city-states didn't happen overnight. The Maya came into existence probably a couple of thousand years before Christ. By 500 BC, population was on the rise, and small communities were turning into the first major Maya sites located throughout Central America. Fully organized kingdoms were ruling the region by 250 AD, with mighty rulers at the helm. They had um, powerful rulers. They were in competition with each other, and sometimes this competition led to war. For the Maya, it was war led by kings in the name of the gods. Maya kings were people like us, but for the Maya, they definitely had attributes of the supernatural. The price of devotion had brutal and sometimes deadly consequences. 
People owed a blood debt to the gods. It wasn't that they didn't regard human life or human blood highly, quite the contrary. Human blood and human life was the most precious, the most sacred thing that could be offered to the gods in order to repay the blood debt that was incurred at creation. Bloodletting and human sacrifice dominated the king's strategic thinking. They picked allies and attacked neighbors, all with an eye on appeasing their deities and staying autonomous. Unlike Rome, in the case of the Maya, we're not dealing with one empire. Instead, we're dealing with a series of rival kingdoms. By the third century AD, Maya civilization was flourishing. No one city ever succeeded in dominating all the others, but one seat of power was on the rise. Its name was Tikal. Tikal is one of the few cities that goes strong in the pre-classic period before the time of Christ and then it just continues pretty much unabated all the way until the end of the classic period. This is a city that never really lost it. But in the sixth century, a rival power named Kalakmul threatened Tikal's success. The Maya had these two great dynastic capitals, Kalakmul and Tikal. Those two cities essentially locked horns. It's really Kalakmul that seems to engage in this action in which they engineer alliances all the way around Tikal, essentially boxing in their enemy. It would be up to an ambitious and visionary leader to build a center of military power, one that would take on Kalakmul. His name was Yikin Khan Kawil. He would construct one of the most iconic structures of the Maya, a pyramid that would stand the test of time, the Temple of the Giant Jaguar. The most valuable monument was one that took a lot of effort. So a big temple pyramid is an indication of your power, your strength, your prestige. It's a way of drawing people into your city because it shows what an awesome, powerful ruler you are. Building in semi-tropical environments with rudimentary materials was a unique challenge, especially when the goal was to build vertically using Stone Age technology. Most of the technology that we associate with big stone constructions were unknown to the Maya. They did not have beasts of burden. They didn't have metal tools. What the Maya did have was a virtually unlimited supply of malleable limestone and a great deal of manpower. Your labor was one of the things that you were required to give to the king on an annual basis. Blocks of limestone were quarried and then pushed, pulled, or carried by sheer force to the construction site. They used something that we call the tump line, and this is a rope that would pass around the forehead, and in that, they could carry, literally at times, hundreds of pounds of debris. Level by level, the pyramid was built skyward. Wooden scaffolding supported the laborers and the structure as it expanded. Skilled masons shaped the limestone with stone tools and wooden mallets. Though the interior was filled with unrefined rubble, the exterior was deceivingly manicured, covered in a strong mortar known as Maya stucco, and painted red. Even though they knew of the wheel, even though they knew of metal, they elected not to make practical use of either of these things. And I think in part, it was because in their worldview, something was much more valuable if a lot of human labor went into it. At nearly 150 feet, the temple of the giant jaguar emerged, facing west toward the setting sun. The ancient skyscraper would command the attention of all who set foot in Tikal's grand plaza as a symbol of power and redemption. But Yikin Khan Kawil's engineering marvel was just the beginning. In 736, Kawil had defeated his ultimate rival, Kalakmul. Then, in 743 and 744, he attacked and eviscerated two critical Kalakmul allies that surrounded Tikal, El Peru to the west and Naranjo to the east. Finally, the suffocating noose that had once strangled Tikal was broken. 
In celebration of this, he builds a, a whole series of, of long major expansions to the palace, uh, new pyramids. And when we look at Tikal today, in many cases, we're looking at the fruits of that success. He may have even launched the construction of the tallest of Tikal's structures, Temple 4. Made of 250,000 cubic yards of stone, the massive pyramid stretched more than 210 feet, or 22 stories high, nearly as tall as the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. It jutted far above the dense rainforest canopy with a 180-degree view of the city. In the distance, other Maya cities were also ambitiously building toward the sky. But at this moment, with King Yakin Khan Kawil at the helm, Tikal was the unchallenged powerhouse of the Maya civilization. But Tikal was not alone. Out of sight, about 250 miles to the west, another dynasty is forging the construction of a great acropolis. There, in the seventh century, a king with a vision would emerge. He would turn one of the wettest cities in the world into a mecca of new world architecture. The view from the top of Temple 4 at Tikal was the backdrop for the Masasi temples in the movie Star Wars. 611 AD, on the outskirts of the Maya world in southeast Mexico, a city by the name of Palenque is on the ropes. It launches a last-ditch defense against regional powerhouse Calakmul. Palenque's forces are overwhelmed, and the king is killed with no male heir to the throne. Because Maya kings were thought to be divine lords, their lineage is key to survival. The end of a dynasty usually spelled disaster. Yet at this critical moment, one of the greatest building campaigns in Maya history was about to begin in Palenque, and the king behind it would remain unknown until the middle of the 20th century. In 1949, some of the questions regarding the mysterious dynasty of Palenque are answered when archaeologist Alberto Ruiz Lullier is excavating this 75-foot high temple, now called the Temple of the Inscriptions. Now, I'm in pretty good shape, but those guys had headdresses and big robes, obsidian knives and swords. I thought I'm in pretty good shape for an old guy anyway. But I don't know how they did it. And I don't know how Alberto Rousselier did it. But I still got a lot to go. And when he gets up into the sanctuary, he looks around. And he notices on the floor a row of holes covered with stone stoppers. And he figures out that these holes were made for ropes in order to pull up the slab, just like I'm on a trap door. So he pulls up the slab, this one exactly, and he follows a steep staircase filled with dirt and debris. He's never seen a Maya pyramid like this before. So his men start digging and digging and digging into the unknown. And the wet stairs are very slippery from the moisture and time and the rain from the forest, and he finally gets down to a plateau. And he notices that the whole pathway doubles back and then continues, and he finds hidden doors secret passageways, signs that a lot of thought and calculation went into building this structure. Finally, after three years, after three long years, he gets to the bottom of this 80-foot stairway, and there he sees a small corridor. And in the corridor is a stone box, and in the box are six skeletons, the remains of souls who were sacrificed to protect the person for whom this temple was built. But he still doesn't know who that person was. And then he finally sees a huge door, a massive triangular stone. So his men and he open it, and then they go in. And behind this huge triangular